How do you sort out the so-called jargon from real-world practices that work? Do the members of your organization find some business advice utterly confusing? Welcome to the 2020s Enterprise with Sam Holzman. In this program, we set the record straight and in terms that people at any level of business and technology can understand. Now, here is your host, Sam Holzman. Welcome to this uh, episode of the 2020s Enterprise. I'm Sam Holzman. And the title of today's episode is Architecting to Create Business Agility to Compete in the Post-Pandemic World. Uh, And if those of you are listening uh, uh, past the actual broadcast, uh, which is May of 2020, uh, I'm sure that you're aware or in the middle of a partial crisis situation to some. And uh, I know this may sound a little bit unusual to you, but a possible opportunity for some. And I'd like to start off with a quote, if I could. Uh, The quote is as follows. In the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. And uh, who actually stated that? Well, somebody a few days ago. Gentleman's name was Sun Tzu, a Chinese military strategist. Now, when I say a few days ago, uh, it was 500 BCE. So, Uh, That's a long time ago, but this concept of taking advantage of situations when things are a bit chaotic uh, is not unusual, and this is not to be uh, advantageous, but to look at these disruptions as a possible opportunity. That's really what we're chatting about in this particular episode, and the concept of business agility, that phrase Uh, frankly, an overused phrase in the uh, management consulting world, uh, we can put some substance to that. And the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic is really the latest in a long list of disruptors to establish business models. This is not the first disruptor, as I can go back to 500 BC, and it's not going to be the last, whether it's competitors, technology, natural disasters, foreign threats, domestic threats, a disruption of some kind to the norm, or the next occurrence of an unknown, businesses are recognizing that change is the new normal. Change is the new normal. And one of the themes beyond uh, this particular episode, and has been a theme throughout my broadcast, is that you need a baseline for addressing and managing change. And that baseline is not 700 pages of text or 70 pages of text in a nice three-ring binder with glossy brochures in it and things like that. That is not anything that you and I, or most human beings, let me be even more direct, 99% of human beings can understand. They need something different. They need a blueprint, if I can use that analogy, something that is human consumable in less than 90 seconds. And so that's what we're talking about. And change is the norm now. And so what we need, once again, is a baseline for addressing change. And the emerging reality does not begin with a new technology. This is not what we're chatting about. And we'll be talking about this a little bit more when I give you an example here from a mid-May article that was really frightening to me. And we'll chat about that in just a moment. Technology may enable what we refer to as a series of business and mission-aligned initiatives to move the organization to its next state. I'm not using the term desired state anymore either because this is what we're seeing in this continuous change world. It's the next state. A deliberate movement away from the language of the desired state is what we're suggesting. It's the next state, the concept of continuous movement Continuous change is what we're talking about. And enterprises will be looking at what businesses they are in now and what would be the state of that business and the next state, whatever that is. It may be something similar. It may be a little bit different. It may be evolving. It may be contraction. It may be expansion. And during this, they're going to be looking at what keeps us in the game today. Of course, we have to be in the game today during this turbulent time and how we can differentiate ourselves to more effectively compete in the next state. 
things will change. What are the business aligned capabilities we have today? What do we have in our inventory that we can possibly leverage? And to be brutally honest, what would we possibly need to get rid of as we move into the next state? What are the business capabilities we need in the next iteration and beyond? So the new model that we're talking about, the new model, is the word stabilize, then prepare to move. In other words, build a baseline and then move. That's going to be the new normal. Now, one of the things that people have relied on is technology. And underlying technology is two things. And I know this may sound basic, but it's really kind of important. Data and the manipulation or usage or processing of that data. The word manipulation is not supposed to be a negative term. It's using the data. So we have data and process. By the way, back in the olden days of technology, we were called data processing. The issue is, the issue is the data. So I'm going to read you a quote here from Peter Aitken, a reporter, and this was published, uh, let me see here, on May 16th for your reference. Title, Imperial College Model Britain Used to Justify Lockdown a, quote, buggy mess, unquote, quote, totally unreliable, unquote, experts claim. Now, let me read, you, read this again without the quotes. Imperial College model Britain used to justify the lockdown, a buggy mess, totally unreliable, experts claim. Now, I'm going to read a couple of, of, of sentences here. This is scary. Please remember what... Prime Minister Johnson based the lockdown of the United Kingdom on was this model. Now, let me read this. The heralded model the United Kingdom experts have largely used to guide their coronavirus policies is totally unreliable, according to experts. Experts have derived the coding from Professor Neil Ferguson, Warning that is a, I love this phrase here as a technologist, is a buggy mess, buggy mess that looks more like a bowl of angel hair pasta than a finely tuned piece of programming. Sorry for chuckling, but we've said this all along in these broadcasts. It's a mess. The technology programming arena is just a mess. Now, a gentleman named David Richards, who has a technology company in Britain, says the following. In our commercial reality, we would fire anyone for developing code like this, and any business that relied on it to produce software for sale would likely go bust. This is how bad this was. Now, this wasn't just yesterday that something came out, because people were, are relying on these predictive models trying to figure out what's going on. And so scientists at the University of Edinburgh claimed that it is impossible to reproduce the same results from the same data using this model. In other words, running this thing twice gives you different answers. That's how bad this is. It's the data is bad. The process is bad. The technology is bad. The team got different results when they used different machines and even different results from the same machine. I've never heard of something like this in my decades and decades and decades of technology. Yet the prime minister, unfortunately, relied on this to cause this traumatic clampdown in the United Kingdom. Now, what's fascinating, of course, is that there's always a comeback. And so I want to give you the full, you know, full, full recognition here. OK, epidemiologist is not a branch of computer science. And the conclusions around lockdown rely not on any mathematical model, but on scientific consensus that COVID-19 is a highly transmittable virus with an infection uh, fatality ratio exceeding 0.5 PC in the UK. So by the way, of course, there's, there's a defense of this lockdown. I understand that, but I want to emphasize again, 
We don't even know what the numbers are there. Now, the last line of this article just shows you there's always some smiles that can occur in these articles. And I'm not smiling from what I'm reading here, but it does bring a little smile to my face just because, you know, the Brits are the Brits and the, and the people in the U.S. are the U.S. And everybody has culture and things like that. And I love the U.K. Uh, anytime I have the ability to go over and do some work over there, I just enjoy it. And so here's the last line of this article. Professor Ferguson himself resigned from his advisory role earlier this month, not because of what you think about the mathematical model, of course, after reports emerged that he defied his own lockdown advice by letting his married lover visit him on two occasions. (laughs) So it wasn't the inaccuracy of his model that caused an issue (laughs) was his extracurricular activities going on there. But again, the key thing is we have to look at is this was relied upon by not only the UK government, but the same thing here in the US also. A lot of what we've done here in the US was based on this model and others. So we have to look at is the underlying actions, the underlying activities. And what I call this is an open loop system. What do I mean by an open loop system? Things are built and things are thrown out there, but nobody does a check. A closed loop system produces quality. An open loop system produces defect. And when you put your name on something and you have a lot of authority behind it, whether it's a large consulting firm or a esteemed epidemiologist professor, you give it more credibility. You give it more credibility. And that's going to be the topic of, of, of partially our next segment also. But one of the things that we're starting to hear are things that we heard a decade ago approximately. People are starting already to say some things like this. Well, you know what? We just got an order last week. So things are turning around, (laughs) okay? We don't have to get so excited about this. Or you'll hear something like this. This feels exactly like what we saw before. And as we know, we came out of this pretty well. So we can wait this one out also. How about this one? And you're hearing this some by lots of politicians also. You know what? This will take care of itself. We're just going to wait this one out. Just a few more days or weeks or months, and and, and we can wait this one out. This is one of the most dangerous things that we're, we're hearing. And this is very common right now, especially when it comes to technology selection. It's referred to as confirmation bias. We found three different studies that support our view that this is just temporary and it's going to go away pretty soon. It's called confirmation bias. And this is a very dangerous trend. It's sort of like that herd mentality. Well, you know, we've got three people that agree with us here. Or we have an expert that came in here and agrees with us. And I have nothing against experts because in some uh, areas, people consider me an expert that's out there. But that's different than proof. It's, it's biasing a confirmation Uh, that you may have. And then at the other end of the scale, for those that want to keep the the clamping of things down more, they're saying, you know what, we can't do anything yet. We need more data. We need more whatever uh, before we can act rationally on this. We don't want to act irrationally right now. and, And we're seeing some of this also. And the final thing that we sometimes hear is, you know what? We've been through three of these. We've been through downturns. We've been through different activities and hurricanes and floods and things like that. We'll just keep doing what we did before and everything will be okay. That may be the case. That may be the case. But none of those are strategies. None of those are dealing with the situation that you and I are discussing here is that change is going to be a continuous activity. This is just one example. 
So we're going to take a quick break here. You're listening to the 2020s Enterprise. I'm Sam Holzman. We'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Virtual Business Architecture Services from the Business Architecture Center of Excellence will provide you with the expertise of our consulting services remotely so you can achieve your goals quickly, efficiently, and economically. Using our business architecture methodology, complemented by our full BACOE practitioner support, we will help you achieve the same great results without any travel at a reduced cost. Please visit BACOE.org backslash virtual hyphen BA for more information. Are you frustrated with your business strategy, mission, or enterprise architecture efforts? If so, the book, Reaching the Pinnacle, a methodology of business understanding, technology planning, and change by leading enterprise architect practitioner Sam Holzman brings a method to the marketing madness that surrounds the enablement of business and mission strategy and enterprise architecture. This helpful, no-nonsense book sheds light on this poorly understood topic. It helps business executives and technology professionals build an enterprise architecture appropriate to their organizational needs, enabling their business and mission strategy. Enterprise architecture is the rethinking of how business and mission planning and information technology can support each other to achieve its strategic and mission objectives through the development of a series of project initiatives and agile models. Reaching the Pinnacle is available at Amazon.com. Are you stuck in your enterprise architecture practice with nothing but a bunch of static models and deliverables aimed at future technology development efforts rather than true business understanding? With the Enterprise Architecture Center of Excellence four-day certification workshops, you will learn proven step-by-step enterprise architecture techniques to be used as the baseline for addressing continuous business and organizational change. For dates, locations, and more, Visit EACOE.org. No travel? No problem. The Enterprise Architecture Center of Excellence and Business Architecture Center of Excellence are experts in offering distance learning enterprise architecture and business architecture certification workshops throughout the year. Your experience mirrors our face to face workshops and are not just remote broadcasts. You will collaborate in teams across the world just as though you were across the table. For dates and registration, visit EACOE.org and BACOE.org. You are listening to The 2020s Enterprise with Sam Holzman. We welcome questions and comments about the program via email to Sam at EACOE.org. That's Sam at EACOE.org. Now, Back to the 2020s Enterprise. Welcome back to the 2020s Enterprise. This is Sam Holzman. And uh, today's topic is titled Architecting to Create Business Agility to Compete in the Post-Pandemic World. And when this all started, I sat back for a moment and, of course, was affected, as most of you were, uh, a little bit of shock and amazement and and uh, a few deep breaths here and there. And one of the things that, for those of you that are regular listeners to the show, you know that one of the phrases I always use in thinking about something is, hmm, that's spelled H-M-M-M-M-M, hmm. And I did the same thing here. I said, wait a minute, but let's just sit back here for a moment and breathe. And it, as you know, uh, you know, the, the television the, the, with the 870,000 channels that are on there. I mean, every you're just getting bombarded with emails and, and, and text messages and television shows and uh, panic all over the place. And this is not correct. And this is correct. And this is what's happening here. And this is what's happening here. It's all pointing fingers, of course. And by the way, pointing fingers are important. Later, uh, we got to get this thing under control. Because it's not really stable right now, at least as far as this particular broadcast date. And I sat back and started thinking about this thing. And I started really feeling a little bit uncomfortable because what came to mind, unfortunately, was 9-11-2001, September 11, 2001. 
I said, is this possibly in a, a terror attack? And if it isn't, it sure seems like the effects of this are orders of magnitudes greater than what happened in 9-11. I am not playing down September 11th, 2001, a horrible tragedy for lots of folks, all these families and people in this country and uh, lots of you know different things that are going on. Please, no, anyone listen to this broadcast, do not think I'm, I'm lessening 9-11-2001. What I'm doing is comparing it to 2001. And I said, there's some similarities here. And so for the first time in my email history, I actually penned a letter, I penned an email, excuse me, to the President of the United States, President Trump. Um, by the way, I haven't gotten a response from him yet. I'm not expecting to. Maybe I will from someone on the staff. Uh, when I didn't get a response from him, I also uh, copied that letter to my two senators. Haven't gotten a response there. And, uh, and the senators from the United States Senate sent it to the House representation I have. Haven't gotten any response there. Sent it to the governor of the state that I'm in. Haven't gotten any response there. Uh, by the way, haven't gotten a response from anybody which is kind of disappointing even to say, you know, go fly a kite. <laughs> but I'm going to read this to you because there's a parallel here that we should start thinking about. And here's the uh, email. Mr. President, we need a THA, a Transportation Health Administration. In January 1892, 1892, that date is correct, by the way, this country realized <clears throat> that as people were coming to the United States from other parts of the world, issues such as health may affect the well-being of the present citizens of the U.S. In January of 1892, Ellis Island was the primary entry point for people coming to the United States from other countries. Putting aside the controversies and some of the actions that were very uncomfortable at Ellis Island, one of the key thoughts in the formation of this entry stop was looking at people coming to this country with possible health issues. Please notice, again, just to pause here for a moment, the parallels of what we're seeing today. A more present-day situation in travel from around the world is, travel from around the world, excuse me, is as common as walking down the street. In September of 2001, a new reality came to the United States. That reality was the negative side of virtually unrestricted travel. And by the way, for those of you that are thinking about this, I'm not thinking about a border wall, by the way. Whether that's a good or bad thing is not something that I'm interested in discussing at all. What we're talking about here is something different. The reaction of the federal government was marvelous and almost immediate the formation of the Transportation Security Administration, TSA. The federal government realized that people could do harm in the United States and its citizens entering from the country undetected. And the TSA was set up to address this. Fast forward to April 2005, when Thomas Friedman wrote the book, The World is Flat. When I read this book, I really got to thinking about that phrase, the world is flat. And in my opinion, the world has been flattened, but it's still tribal. And the concept of tribes is that each group of people have their own strengths, weaknesses, actions, activities, foods, health, habits, and protocols. In January of 2020, most people would suggest was the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the United States. We need a similar type of organization that was formed in November of 2001, the TSA. September 2001 was an attack on this country. A few months later, the Transportation Security Administration was formed. My request to you and the officials in Washington, D.C., Congress, and those in charge 
is to take a serious look at forming the THA as soon as possible. What we are seeing is, as COVID-19, in my opinion, is the beginning of the understanding that worldwide travel has strengths and weakness, weaknesses, benefits and drawbacks. We have to address the fleet free flow of people coming to the United States and the movement of people around the world. We have to recognize that sometimes these tribes bring things into the U.S. that actually may harm the citizenry here. I hope this is taken seriously. My intent on using the phrase tribal is in no way intended to identify or malign any group. It's a word that I use to differentiate what Thomas Friesman stated in his book and what I view as the current situation. Thank you for reading this. If I can assist in any way, please do not hesitate to contact me. The reason I read this to you is because that's what's going on right now. It's this transformation that is affecting the world very rapidly now, but it really has to do with the free flow of everything. I gave you the transportation example, but it's the free flow of information, of data, of everything, of products and services And we don't know how to handle that. And enterprises and corporations and businesses are having a devil of a time in changing this. So this sort of like step function, this virus caused a blip. It's not going to be the last. We're going to have hurricanes and we're going to have floods and we're going to have storms and we're going to have drought and we're going to have all these other things. And hopefully we'll never have another terrorist attack. But I don't know. And one of the things that you and I have to recognize, if anybody says to you, here's what's going to happen three years from now, just say, hmm, (laughs) as kindly as possible. So what we need is a baseline, a baseline for addressing and managing continuous change so that we can look at this baseline and analyze what's happening now and project out the possibilities Nothing is guaranteed, of course, but the possibilities. And what's fascinating is that in our company, and we are a very small boutique company compared to probably some of the listeners that that we have on the show, we were prepared for a disruption in person-to-person contact, if I can use that phrase, for the last seven years. We were able to support our clients the next day day, the next morning, virtually through various environments. And we had backup for those environments only because we actually had a blueprint, a strategy, what if analysis, and it wasn't 17 pages of PowerPoint slides or 700 pages of text. It was a blueprint that allow us to do what if analysis. What if the goals change? What if the processes change? What if the location of things that we can do changes? What if the skill set changes all of uh, of a sudden? And what are the events that we can look at that we know about are impossible? What, how, where, who, and why? The keys to enterprise agility is having these elements in stock as we see them so that we can analyze and do what if analysis. There are six elements that we have to understand. And we've had those, and we practice those, and we consult on those. And yes, we eat our own dog food. We make sure that we have in our own organization that true enterprise agility to act and react to things. And I'm not going to suggest to you, by the way, that I can predict what's going to happen one millisecond from now. And by the way, if anyone can, for example, uh, Anybody can tell me the stock price of any stock five seconds from now uh, with 100% certainty. Uh, please give me a call and we'll time that out. And if you're accurate, we'll take you all to Tahiti, so to speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Only a partial joke. But so what we're doing is trying to guess better. We're trying to guess better. So, no, I can't predict if we're going to have another type of virus uh, in the fall of this year. But I can assure you that there will be another disruption of some kind, and we're ready for it. Our organization has been ready for it, and you can be too. There's nothing presented, presenting 
uh, p- preventing you, excuse me, from being ready, except your will to be ready. I know that sounds funny. There's nothing magic here, and it is not about the latest whiz bang technological magic that you may find out there. It's providing a baseline for addressing and managing change, a baseline for addressing and managing change. That's what we have to do. And one of those elements is to look at the present situation, for example, and determine how much to you the future will look like in the past. So, for example, if you have to go to a remote environment with your customers or your clients or your family, whatever it is, do you have that ability? Yes or no? And if so, to what degree? It's a simple question. If the answer is no, then you say to yourself, well, I think the risk of not having that is X, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live with that risk. That becomes an event that you've studied and said, I'm going to look. Now, you may bet wrong, and I understand that. We all do. Boy, I wish we could bet correctly all the time. We can't. So what we can do is to look at our, quote, as-is state in our next state and see whether or not this is something that we believe we should take actions on. And I can assure you that some of the things that we've looked at, we have not put in place today for whether it was economic reasons or whether it was probabilities. We said, you know what? The probability of this occurring, in our opinion, is X. And something below, X or below, we are not going to take actions on. And we're deliberately stating that. We're deliberately stating that. We've studied it. And we said, you know what? We don't have to actually do this in our opinion. We may be wrong. I don't know. But we have looked at it and we said, you know what, we're going to put this one aside here for a moment. And we have to look at the various levels in our organization to think about this. You know, at the, at the overarching corporate level or the ecosystem, what businesses are we in and do we have to change the actual underlying business model, um, you know, the, that we have? You know, for example, once again, coming back to our training world, uh, most of the training was done in classroom environments. And of course, when that was closed down, we talked to our clients and they said, can you support us in a virtual environment? I says, absolutely. Let's give you a test tomorrow morning. And they sometimes were shocked. What do you mean, do you mean tomorrow morning? Yeah, we're all ready for this. Let's see if it's comfortable for you. You may or may not be comfortable We've simulated the environment. We have breakout sessions we can do. We can have collaboration. We have all of this infrastructure in place. All of our training materials and things like that are available to you. And it's the only thing we can't do is high touch, if you're comfortable with that. So the business is changing. And, of course, the capabilities that we need may be changing also. So we had this capability in inventory And we had to, quote, crank it up a little bit. And we had to lessen our dependence on uh, on three ring binders of training materials and go to a virtual environment and case studies and things. It was all available to us so that we can move forward very quickly. So we're going to take another short break here. We're talking about this environment we call the crisis situation and how we can possibly look at this a little bit differently because there will be another one. This is Sam Holzman. We'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Virtual Business Architecture Services from the Business Architecture Center of Excellence will provide you with the expertise of our consulting services remotely so you can achieve your goals quickly, efficiently, and economically. Using our business architecture methodology complemented by our full BACOE practitioner support, we will help you achieve the same great results without any travel at a reduced cost. Please visit BACOE.org backslash virtual hyphen BA for more information. Are you frustrated with your business strategy, mission, or enterprise architecture efforts? If so, the book, Reaching the Pinnacle, a methodology of business understanding, technology planning, and change by leading enterprise architect practitioner Sam Holzman brings a method to the marketing madness that surrounds the enablement of business and mission strategy and enterprise architecture. This helpful, no-nonsense book sheds light on this poorly understood topic. 
It helps business executives and technology professionals build an enterprise architecture appropriate to their organizational needs, enabling their business and mission strategy. Enterprise architecture is the rethinking of how business and mission planning and information technology can support each other to achieve its strategic and mission objectives through the development of a series of project initiatives and agile models. Reaching the Pinnacle is available at Amazon.com. Based on over 30 years of real-world experience, the Business Architecture Center of Excellence four-day certification workshops in business architecture will guide you beyond theory and into actual implementation. If you are looking to develop a baseline for business agility through goal-aligned, prioritized capabilities, we will help you get there. You will leave our workshop with real tools, processes, techniques, and most importantly, true hands-on business architecture project practice. For dates, locations, and more, visit BACOE.org. No travel? No problem. The Enterprise Architecture Center of Excellence and Business Architecture Center of Excellence are experts in offering distance learning enterprise architecture and business architecture certification workshops throughout the year. Your experience mirrors our face-to-face workshops and are not just remote broadcasts. You will collaborate in teams across the world, just as though you were across the table. For dates and registration, visit EACOE.org and BACOE.org. You are listening to The 2020s Enterprise with Sam Holtzman. We welcome questions and comments about the program via email to sam at EACOE.org. That's sam at EACOE.org. Now, back to the 2020s Enterprise. Welcome back to the 2020s Enterprise. I'm Sam Holzman, and the topic today is Architecting to Create Business Agility to Compete in the Post-Pandemic World. And in our last break, we were talking about building a baseline for addressing and managing change, a baseline for addressing and managing change, knowing that there will be another disruption of some kind. It may be less severe, it may be more severe, whether it's a drought, a famine, uh, a um, terrorist situation, a new competitor coming into the marketplace, a change in the market dynamics of what's going on. People call them disruptions. I call them changes. They're just going to be a change. And we have to be ready for these types of changes as best we can. And in order to do that, we need a baseline for addressing and managing change. And as you've all heard listening to this program, um, you know, over the months and months that we've been on the air, you hear consistently that there are six things that we need to know in order to understand the as-is state and what I'm now referring to as the next state as best we can. And then we can build essentially a roadmap. And that roadmap is going to change. It's sort of like a GPS. And the difference between a GPS and a physical map is just that. As we make changes, as we move around a little bit, you know what? Sometimes we have to change that route a little bit. In order to do that, we know where we want to end up. We need to believe that we know as best we can we may, where we want to end up. And sometimes that may change because we find out, for example, that a certain road is blocked and we can't get there or a certain combination of talents and techniques and methodologies and processes aren't there. So we have to change direction. Again, I don't want anyone to think that I can predict out into the future. I really can't. And, of course, my, my world of, of investment is I buy high and sell low. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of the financial advice I want to be careful of. That's just a little bit of a joke that's there. So what we have to think about is the next iteration, the next step, the next change. It's, gonna, it's not going to be the next normal. It's going to be the next phase. And as I say, the model that we're looking at is what we refer to as stabilize, then move. And so we say there's a desired state. No, we say there's the next state. We have the as is state and the next state. 
And that's not just a play on words. It's to get people to recognize that change is constant. And in order to do that, we need to be able to have a baseline for addressing and managing change. And the next phase may look 80% like today or 20% like today. We don't know. But we have this ability to do this maneuverability, this concept that's there. And what we want to look at is this new normal. So, for example, one of the phrases I heard recently is what all of us are doing is sleeping at the office. Now, when I heard that, I, I smiled. I said, well, what, is, what does that mean? Well, of course I know what it means. Since you're working from home and that's your office, you're sleeping at the office. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be permanent or not. I, I know that there's a lot of organizations that have these massive, beautiful headquarters with their names ensconced on the top of these 50-story buildings, and there's an ego portion of that. Now, there's also, of course, and there's a debate here, whether or not line-of-sight management is what I call it. In other words, people on site that you can see each other. And the the managers and executives and the supervisors can see each other. That's why I call it line of sight management. That's not supposed to be negative. It just gives you a sort of a visual versus a virtual environment. Which one is better? And the answer is yes. Uh, You're seeing as we're going through this change right now, different operating models that people are looking at. People of some organizations have already announced, you know, you never have to come back to the office if you don't want to. Some other people, and including some of the staff, say, you know what, I want to be at the office because the old phrase, the old adage was out of sight, out of mind. So if I'm out of sight, uh, nobody knows I'm there. But today, maybe the out of sight isn't as bad because we do have insight called you know, meetings not only by audio or text, but video. Maybe we should be walking around with a camera in front of us all the time, or at least having a a visual contact. I remember uh, in The Big Bang Theory, one of the episodes, uh, Dr. Sheldon Cooper decided one day to become virtual and never come out of his bedroom. So he was sitting in his bedroom, and he had a uh, sort of like a, a, uh, it, it wasn't a robot, it was a movable platform that he had put uh, essentially an electronic screen on which had his picture on it. And that was what he was interacting with his, his roommates and his friends. So that was roaming around with them. Uh, that was out there. It's very similar to what's going on. It was, it was a funny episode, but it was a prelude to some of the things going on. And if any of you want to see a glimpse of the future, and some of you that do know me know that my favorite television program of all time, probably of all time, was the Jetsons. (laughs) And some of the things going on there are really hitting home right now. Uh, as far as the way the family interacted with with uh, technology and also some of the things that they did on a personal level and some of the trials and tribulations that they had, some of the benefits of this and some of the drawbacks of what was going on. Uh, it was really kind of uh, in- interesting stuff. And, you know, some of the things that you see on that program from decades ago are what we're seeing now. And what we should be thinking about is when we look at the talents that we have, one of the what, how, where, who, who, when, and why elements, that's the who, we should start thinking about how to organize work for a possible distributed workforce because we know that's going to happen in the short term and it may be a long-term situation. So maybe we all can't get back to the office or maybe If we look at this distancing requirement that's out there, all of us can't be there at the same time. It's not going to be possible through legislation or beliefs or whatever it is. We know it's going to happen, at least in the short term. So we have to start thinking about those types of, you know, situations, you know, as as we see it. You know, remote work has some some benefits. You know, there's no commuting, uh, you know, that's out there. Uh, The question is, how do you address this? Um, I know, you know, my daughter 
uh, and uh, son-in-law work. Uh, they're both at home. Uh, we're blessed with two grandchildren. And this is a struggle for them because the children aren't going to school. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you balance or how do you manage working parents, working out of the house, children that are in the house, uh, they're at an age right now of, you know, be, uh, they're between four and five years old, about four and a half years old. So they're not in full-time school yet, but they were in school uh, during the day for most of the day, which allowed, of course, before this uh, for, you know, offsite work. Just think about coming out of this. People are talking about coming out of this and going back to the new normal, whatever the normal is. But no. This, these are big issues that are popping up here. We don't know how to handle these things. So you know what? Maybe we should start thinking about these today. This is an event, once again, that is happening right now. And that essentially is the ability of people working in a different environment when there are dependents. And by the way, those dependents could be older people or younger people that's out there. So what do we define as agility in this environment and the concept of changing that we're talking about, this constant change. So agility to us is what we refer to as the ability to assemble what we need as the changes occur. And we call that assembling to order, assembling to order. So that environment that we need is also a requirement. And we've talked about those in many previous episodes. If you want to listen to some of the previous episodes, you'll see that we consider this as the fundamental requirement for an agile enterprise, an agile business. It's tried and true everywhere. And now it's coming to be tried and true in the concept of computers and technology. And when it comes to the digital transformation that we hear a lot about, and people are talking about this digital transformation going on, the underlying weakness is still, is still, and has been, as you saw from the study that we quoted uh, about the the British uh, models, the data, the data was never built for the type of purposes that we're using it today. So we're going to have to start paying a tremendous amount of of, of attention to the data that underlies the digital transformation. Remember that the digital transformation really consists of two things, the pipe and what goes through the pipe. And the pipe doesn't care. In other words, the internet doesn't care if the stuff is good or not. It could care less. <laughs> it's going to pipe pump that stuff through there. And so we have to recognize that if we have a situation where we're relying more and more on bits and bytes, that that stuff has to really, really be accurate. And a quote that an acquaintance of ours said one day, um, he's in the manufacturing world. He said, you know, we've got to switch from just-in-time types of environments to also think about, and he, he looked at me in the face and said, this is you if you can, if you can picture yourself in this mode. Because all you keep talking about is being ready. He says, forget just in time. It's your whole environment is built around just in case. <laughs> in other words, if this, then that. If this, then that. Just in case this comes up, do we have the ability to address this? And as we're looking out there, there's going to be trade-offs between you and I being able to function 5,000 miles apart and five feet apart. There's a difference, or 500 feet apart. And of course, when it comes to product, we're seeing this all the time. In other words, if I have a product and I'm building a product in my organization, is it better for me to have the ability to be 500 feet away from my suppliers so that I can react in 24 hours? Or is it okay if I'm 5,000 miles away and I'm going to react in 25 days? We call that right sourcing, right sourcing. 
And that's a huge topic right now with the repatriation we're seeing, for example, in cloud computing. People are recognizing there isn't one answer. So in these components that you and I have been talking about in this, this uh, episode, what we're suggesting to the audience is that what we have here is the opportunity to recognize that the concept of change is now constant. Some of the change will be forced on us, like this coronavirus situation. Some of it is going to be competitive. Some of it is going to be multinational. For example, is globalization going to actually occur, or is this the damper on that? We're going to go back to a different form because we see the difficulties of sourcing around the world, or there's going to be some balance. I I personally believe there will be some balance. But once again, what's the underlying phrase? Change. So we start with the goals that we're trying to achieve. We look at the processes that we need to achieve those goals and see if we have a stable set of processes or those processes are going to change over time, as best we know, to the next iteration. Then we look at the data. Do we have the data, solid data, that has been verified and vetted to be able to act on those processes to achieve the goals of our organization? Do we have the skills? The skills are changing. It's very difficult in a remote world, I know this sounds funny, to not be able to type on a keyboard. Now there may be some voice controls or things like that. What about the people in our society and in our businesses that don't have home computers, don't have high-speed access uh, to uh, the Internet, or don't have video abilities that are out there? How are they going to interact they're, you know, at a disadvantage. What about schools? Is virtual schooling the same as on-campus schooling? We had an episode of the 2020s Enterprise that, if you haven't listened to it, I would really suggest you tune in. It was quite, quite eye-opening to see the changes going on and the difficulties. Some of our more storied institutions of higher learning are having when it comes to these types of things. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity, is what we are suggesting, a huge opportunity. And perhaps we should take advantage of this. Thank you for listening. The most important thing I want to close with is please stay well, stay healthy. And please give us a call. We'd be more than happy to help you in this new transition that's there. Until next time. Sam Holzman, thank you very much for listening. Hi, my name is Sam Holzman with the Business Architecture Center of Excellence. The sole mission of our organization is to help your organization move from the industrial age through the internet age into the information age. Since 1972, our firm has been dedicated to the practice of business architecture and what we now refer to as Business Architecture 3.0. Business Architecture 1.0 began with Dewey Walker in 1966 when he was at IBM and came up with the process called Business Systems Planning, which was focused on understanding your enterprise through the eyes of building information systems. Business Architecture 2.0 was focused on what needed to be done prior to implementation of information systems. We're now into Business Architecture 3.0, which is about information not focused on the internet or the technology of delivery. We're moving into the information age and BA 3.0 that we practice is about understanding the business through a series of human consumable representations rather than looking at the enterprise through the eyes of the computer system or compilers. Our organization is passionate about this topic and we are professionals in this field. We are not general contractors. We are architects. As in the physical world, you hire architects to do architecture and general contractors to do construction and delivery. The business architect is the voice of the customer. Our organization is here to help you move from the industrial age through the internet age into the information age to make your organization the most agile organization in its field. Please give us a call or email us, and we'll be more than happy to discuss the services that we have. These services range from training, certification, 
consulting, mentoring through full responsibility for your business architecture activities. We look forward to hearing from you. Please give us a call or email us. Thank you very much.